It's our honor to have partnered with the Center for the History of Medicine on this presentation tonight. So I will, with no further ado, invite Dr. Markle to come out right now. Well, well thank you. Uh, what a happy occasion. Um, I, was also, I almost came out here coughing, but I thought that would be in bad taste. Too soon, too soon. Um, it, it's, my, it's really my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, a colleague and a, and a dear friend, uh, Dr. Martin Citron, who is the director uh, of the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine uh, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, I met Marty, uh, gosh, I think 15 or more years ago, and we uh, very quickly bonded as friends and have long been colleagues and uh, collaborators. And I insist, he, insi he just said during the movie, I have the best job in the world. And I thought to myself, no, no, I have the best job in the world because I study epidemics from the distance of 100 years. And, and Marty actually is there. So whenever there is something wrong in the world that's infectious, Marty is there. So whether, most recently with Ebola. So w without further ado for a, a Q&A and a chalk talk, here's Dr. Marty Citron. Thank Thanks. I got one. Thank you, Howard. Um, it's, 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 it was, it's scary. It's, it's sort of petrifying. And the thing that I get asked most often is how much of that, what you saw and the fear that it generates um, is, is Hollywood and how much of that, you know, uh, can happen. And um, that's a tough question. This, this film was really, really well researched for a fair amount of time um, with the, the filmmakers and the actors coming to CDC and kind of getting into our shoes and, uh, and asking what it would really be like. And I don't know how many people, show of hands, how many people saw Outbreak, the Dustin Hoffman version of this? Many, most of you. So I saw that and I said, that is so far off base. Um, never happened. It's just, it, it's pure Hollywood fiction and really designed to gin up a lot of drama. And then when this film opened, we had a special opening in Atlanta for the CDC audience and the, and the lead uh, actors and stuff came and uh, opened it. And we had a little conversation kind of afterwards like this and uh, they said, well, what do you think? Did we do a decent job at portraying, uh, at portraying your work and what could happen? And we were um, uniformly stunned at, at how well that this movie in a very compressed time frame kind of conveys um, scenario which is plausible in, in many ways. Now, not every detail in this film is plausible, but the basic concepts and the issues that are raised are issues that I've seen in my 23 years at CDC raised in many big epidemics. And then this all happened and you know, came about and this movie was made and released before this past year with the just devastating uh, epidemic of Ebola virus disease in West Africa. And over this past year, we're, we're probably a little over a year into patient zero. Um, and I'm struck even more seeing this for a second time after the last year spending um, in the operations center at CDC and in international response um, at how many of these issues um, are, have played out in West Africa. And if you think this was frightening, if you think this was frightening, uh, <laughs> designed to scare me, um, the, the last year of, of, of watching the Ebola virus um, devastate um, three, three countries the way it has, it, much more than you know, an epidemic of an infectious disease or an outbreak, it translates into this whole of society, complex humanitarian crisis with ethical issues and um, scarcity issues and helplessness issues and a level of the epidemic of disease followed by an epidemic of fear followed by stigmatization. A lot of what you saw in terms of those issues played out here are exactly um, what, what's played out in, in West Africa and a certain amount of hysteria that played out in the fall in this country when we had a small handful number of cases. All of the dilemmas, you know, healthcare workers going into battle, getting sick, becoming the victims of the battle, 
um, safe evacuation for your own staff, the dilemmas of how to allocate resources and where to provide care, the uncertainty, the snake oil salesman, the, um, all of the kinds of issues that this film raises um, really do get raised in these types of epidemics. And one thing, and each one, whether it's SARS or H1N1 uh, or pandemic influenza um, of other sorts or Nipah virus, this, this scenario was kind of a, a crossbreed between a Nipah virus and bats merging with a, a respiratory virus that we see in, in, uh, in poultry as well as in, in pigs and swine, and creating a hybrid. Um, all of what, no matter what they are, when you think you've sort of studied it and you understand and maybe have some idea on what's going to happen, there's always these new curveballs. So we'd seen Ebola in West Africa. I mean, we'd seen Ebola on the African continent since 1976, numerous outbreaks, but never actually with the twists and turns that the epidemic presented um, this year. Partly because of massive disparities, a uh, tremendous amount of poverty, um, an epidemic that occurred in a, frail, in a frail health system at its start and one that was quickly devastated by the, by the epidemic afterward in a place that had been fraught for two decades with civil war and violence, in a place that had never seen Ebola before, um, challenging cultural practices and understanding, safe burial, which was better understood about the role of, of dead bodies transmitting Ebola virus in Central Africa after many years of experience were concepts that were very new to West Africa and trying to convince communities and populations that cremation was a safer way or there were safer ways to honor the dead than the traditional burial practices which were very high risk. All enormous challenges, mass graves, calling and not getting help, setting up um, major stadium-based treatment centers, all the issues that, that this film raised <clears throat> played out in some ways in reality over the past year in West Africa. And it's, um, it is scary. And one thing I can say in terms of dealing with that anxiety and fear is um, the first instinct for a lot of folks is to get into a retreat into a place of denial. And the kind of the last thing that would be helpful one is to recognize that the denial is a very powerful thing. And the first onset of symptoms are often people, their head won't let them go to, could this be Ebola? They're going to imagine it's malaria or flu or something else. Um, but to acknowledge that that's part of the human instinct and be able to have a means for overcoming that denial. And then to basically, after your amygdala has been hijacked by fear and denial as a self-protective instinct, to emerge from a place where you go back to patterns and exercises and protocols and preparedness. And so I think the lesson that I take from this film coming out before Ebola 2014 and seeing it again after and having gone through this experience um, of the past year is that the value of um, preparing, developing scenarios, doing contingencies, exercising, integrating, um, the transparency uh, that's needed in communication and probably the number one predictor of how a community or a society is going to be able to face a major epidemic and develop resilience to get through it has to do with a single word, which is trust. And if you destroy um, trust, whether it's trust in institutions, trust in leaders, trust in your community, trust in your family, or even trust in yourself, when there's a bankruptcy of trust, almost nothing that can be said in order to convey the messages and, and get people into a protective space, a healthy space, can really overcome that bankruptcy of trust. But the bank account of trust has to be built well in advance. And so it doesn't help when you have two decades of civil war, a generation raised without schools and education, a mountain of illiteracy, um, all sorts of things. If you have to bring these types of control measures into place, and your institutional and community and relationship trusts are bankrupt, it's going to be really, really difficult. And you have to build that, that bank account of trust well in advance through preparedness, through, through reliability, accountability, good advice, being there. It's not about not making mistakes. It's about being able to learn from mistakes as you go uh, and be able to iterate on them and change tact and change decisions and uh, not hold on to assumptions
um, as, a, as a place of ego, but being able to move through and continue to build that bank ac account of trust. So communication and transparencies are big currencies in that bank account. And planning and building that trust up in institutions, in your leaders, um, in your communities, um, having those frank conversations is about the only thing I know that will reliably get folks through scenarios like this. So that's about all I really wanted to say in terms of, of context, um, but I thought we would take the next little bit of time and um, do some questions and answers and see I have what a microphone people are here thinking you about. So we'll, we'll pass the microphone around. They were supposed to be um, blowing up that one, that one slide up there, which is a picture of the Ebola virus, Ebola Zaire from 2014. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, I got a question. I mean, my hat's off to all these uh, medical professionals who give up their time and their energy and they go out to Africa and stuff like that to help fight this thing. But then once Ebola was recognized as a 21-day um, process as far as possibly catching it, um, they come back, and, for example, to the U.S., and they're, they're allowed to go back on the street immediately when we notice a 21-day incubation period. Specifically, I remember the woman who came back to Boston, she was hospitalized and sued or filed a lawsuit so she could be released to go back to Maine, as well as the woman or the nurse in Dallas who was taking care of an Ebola patient, went to Cleveland, and then came back and found out that she had, she had suffered from Ebola. If there's a 21 day, why aren't we enforcing that? And these professionals, with, once again, with the greatest respect, shouldn't they know in advance that they have to go through that quarantine process before they go back on the street? So that's a good question. You're raising the question of quarantine, and let me just um, back up a little and um, give some definition. So isolation is the separation of sick people believed to be exposed or con uh, believed to be infected or confirmed to be infected with contagious disease. And quarantine is a period of separation of someone who's still well, not yet sick, but could have been exposed. And for some diseases, asymptomatic people can be contagious and spread before symptoms onset. And in some cases for influenza virus, there's transmission that it can occur before the first fever. In the case of Ebola virus, um, people are not contagious before they get sick, which is a really good thing. So we know a lot about how that virus is spread through contact with infected secretions. It also turns out that the viral load, the degree of contagiousness, continues to increase after symptom onset, usually with the first fever, and it increases over the course of the illness until the person either, the person recovers and they develop an immune system and their viral load starts to go down and then they're no longer infectious. Um, if they succumb and die from the virus, unfortunately the corpse is exceedingly contagious. And so it's one of those diseases which is spread by the, the victim's dead bodies because the virus is still present in the, in the fluids. And so traditional burial practices which bathe and honor and kiss and touch and have a lot of interaction with the dead bodies are, are very, very dangerous. Um, when what the nurse knew who came into New Jersey and ultimately went up to Maine and many other healthcare workers do know is that while they're feeling well and asymptomatic, they're not infectious. So in their minds, they're not posing a risk to others. And, and they understand that from understanding the, the details of the virus. For the rest of the population who's well, the conceptions and the fears about that transmission of lethal, horrible virus overwhelm and their sense of trust that the other individual doesn't represent a threat to them comes into question. So now you have this balance of what's the best way to protect the, the well non-exposed community who's very afraid of someone who's simply been in the area regardless of what protective um, equipment they use while they were caring for sick. And the, and the question in this disease has come up is, is there a role for quarantine, for a 21 day quarantine during an incubation period? It's a difficult question. It often means balancing individual liberties against public good, and the, the pendulum will swing. As you saw, New Jersey the governor and, and the New York state governor felt like all healthcare workers returning from, in fact, everyone returning from the area, but especially healthcare workers, ought to have a 21-day quarantine at home without any interaction with the public. 
um, until they were out from the incubation period. We did a lot of um, thinking about what made sense in that and developed a set of guidance where we, you know, my, my feeling is when you use a tool like quarantine, there's a thousand ways to get it wrong and just a few ways to get it right. And you're trying to find that right balance and thread a needle. One thing that was clearly true is if you make, uh, what, so what are the downsides of just having all these people stay home for another 21 days? Some of the downsides include not being able to get people to respond and go to the area. It was already arduous for people to volunteer for the months, a month or sometimes many months leading up to it. And having them, you know, having a quarantine imposed could be a big disincentive. The most important way to control that epidemic was to get resources into the hot zone in the middle. And they also know, like we know, that that's the person's not contagious or at risk. They also say, we're going to monitor ourselves, and as soon as we have any symptoms, then we'll enter a, a self-isolation period or get evaluated. But there was a strong sense after the fall's experience that maybe you can't trust that person to isolate immediately at the first symptom, or maybe there'll be some denial, and can you really afford not knowing when those first symptoms occur whether someone's going to be out in public? Same thing happened, you know, the experience in New York City with the returning physician who was well, went to a bowling alley, used the New York subway, the next day got a fever, did all the right things. But the question is, what if that fever occurred when they were in a public setting? So is quarantine appropriate? So we did a lot of, of really careful uh, analysis and thinking and assessment about this, as well as interacting with political leadership. And we developed a set of movement and monitoring guidance that stratified the risk um, of the individual based on their type of exposure. And we had high, medium, low, but not zero, and no risk. And we had very clear definitions of what categorized that. We only recommended a full 21-day home quarantine, no contact with others, for people that were in the highest risk category. And the people who returned that you spoke of were not in that category, actually. Um, they practiced as healthcare workers in full PPE, using all the appropriate precautions. And although they were in the area and doing heroic work in, in treatment, um, they, were, they were being very careful. In fact, the, the criteria for them to go in there in addition to the training also involved having buddy systems and monitoring. Now, if a healthcare worker had a breach in their PPE or had a needle stick or an unrecognized exposure or a splash injury or something like it occurred in the, in the Dallas hospital, those people were in the, are placed in the high risk group and we did recommend them for full quarantine. The medium and the low but not zero risk group were recommended for a type of active daily monitoring. Um, active monitoring, temperature checks twice a day, reporting into the health authority in your jurisdiction. Direct active monitoring meant visible um, contact and a, a witnessed twice daily fever check and a visit to, to the person directly. And so, um, you know, Casey Hickox, who you, you were referring to, um, really was participating in those CDC recommended direct active monitoring programs was in the some but not um, high risk category and was following the appropriate recommended guidance. I think she was also, you know, attempting to make a point about not overreaching that area. But it was, um, it was important to realize that it's not like the issue was put off and we weren't being cavalier about trying to expose everyone, but you have to balance the risks in an appropriate way. And um, if not, I think you end up potentially losing credibility and doing you know, potentially more harm than good. It's not always easy to get it right. Our first stab on our movement and monitoring guidance had people doing self-monitoring for the 21 days, but without an active component where they checked in with someone else or without a directly visual, uh, visible component. And we evolved and, and tightened that up, um, that guidance. Um, and we had a number of restrictions on people's movement in the monitoring period, in addition to checking with health departments, whether they could use public transit, what type of um, movement was permissible. So quarantine is a, is a range of activity. It's not a one thing where people kind of get locked up and throw away the key. It's a range of movement restrictions and monitoring from a legal perspective, from an op operational perspective, and then there's from the uh, ethical perspective. 
and to do quarantine right to protect the public as well as respect the individuals is, is hard. It requires planning and it requires threading the needle and, and getting it right. And a, a, a fair amount of trust on all parties, the well who are fearful, the sick who have obligations, the government who has a responsibility on all sides of that equation, particularly in, in my role in protecting the public as well, and trying to, you know, really trying to thread a needle and get that issue just right. It was easy to stigmatize healthcare workers that were returning from West Africa or all of their arrivals, um, but in fact they are heroes and framing those people for what they're doing to control the epidemic and keeping us all safe was a very important reframing of, of the issue that I think, you know, had to take place. Um, we did set up a, a program to, to, um, to monitor this monitoring, if you will. So we, uh, in addition to the exit screening that's still taking place in West Africa um, to prevent sick people or exposed or infected people or people on contact list from getting on the planes to travel at all, we also have an entry um, screening program we funneled all West African arrivals from the affected countries into five airports, and we meet them. We have a team of people from my staff that meet every single person every day. That We give them a care kit, check and report Ebola with a thermometer, a temperature log, educational information, a wallet card with an 800 number, and we give them a, a free cell phone with 30 days of service that they use to make um, regular contact. If they lose contact with their monitoring obligations, then you step up. The, the types of restrictions. And to date, since October 11th, when the program started, we've monitored over 9,000 arrivals from, from West Africa every day for 21 days until they're out from the incubation period. That's not something that's well publicized or that people know, but there is this program of safe public safety and precaution that is in place um, that doesn't, it's, you know, we, what we try to aim for is the least restrictive but safest means within the science is possible um, to respect that boundary. And that's where we have en ended up with regard to Ebola and, and the situation. So I can understand how others may see it differently, but I think we ended up, at least I feel like we ended up at the, at the right place from a, both a policy perspective. When we use tools like quarantine, we ask ourselves you know, three things. May I do it? Is the legal authority there to take the actions that we want? Can I do this? In, in a way that is um, healthy, safe, effective, meets its objectives? Is it operationally feasible? Do I have the resources? Do I have the resources to avoid the chaos that you saw on the screen here? Making sure people are fa fed, sheltered, cared for, provide diagnostic access, humane and dignified treatment to people who make sacrifices for the protection of the others. So it's may I, can I, and the last thing is should I? Is it the right policy call? Is this the right thing to do? And that often means asking yourselves ethical questions. Um, is the harm justifiable for the, in, the restriction of the liberties? And the, the disease serious enough? Yeah, in this case, yes, so the harm's justifiable. Is the means by which I would restrict this movement proportionate to the threat? Do I have the right balance? Do, or, or are we overshooting by locking everybody up? Is there um, a due process? Is there transparency? Can someone appeal? Um, is it, uh, am I providing the uh, ethical right supplies, goods and services needs? Am I meeting the needs? And those are kind of the tests that we use on the policy side of the, of the should, I, should I. So may I by legal authority, can I operationally and should I? And if you, if you can't meet all those things, then you risk losing um, ground in public trust by implementing some of these uh, important emergency tools and powers. So I think, you know, Again, I'm biased, but I think we got it right on Ebola and protecting the U.S. public. Um, and it's, it was, it's a lot of work, and there are a thousand ways to get it wrong, including ways that mistakes that were made in West Africa in the use of quarantine and border closures. And some of you may have seen the military involved in, in West Point, Monrovia, in a slum with barbed wire and the confrontation in cultures and leveraging the instinct of people to flee. And I think that's a way to get it wrong if you kind of miss, miss shoot on it. So it's not easy. These, these aren't easy calls, and they're very challenging. Doctor, More the questions. film uh, stressed the uh, research and, and the good work that's been done to uh, find a vaccine which would be effective against a 
outbreak. Uh, I'm a health instructor in the Caribbean and in Brazil. And um, I've had friends who've told me about the incidence of SARS in back when that was uh, prevalent. And they tell me there were certain countries which had very low outbreak in Asia. One of them was Korea. And they tell me that it was due to the strong immune systems of the people, not necessarily to the vaccine. Has any research been done to go back and look at why these uh, epidemics impacted Hong Kong and other countries, possibly more, or communities, more than others? And was there a reason for the stronger immune system? So that's a great question. And clearly, personal immunity plays a role not only in who gets sick, but in the severity of illness. And some of that is, gener uh, is genetic, and some of it is nurture in terms of health. And so people who are infirmed and have, are malnourished are going to have lower immune systems might be more likely to be with, both be infected and have a severe illness or outcome or die. Um, I don't know that, I mean, there are many other explanations for why SARS didn't uh, get to Korea. I don't know that I've heard the one about the immune system per se, but it's a pretty closed off um, country and society. And so there, you saw Matt Damon tried to uh, employ what we call protective sequestration of his daughter and his family. And sometimes being, you know, if you're well, being simply shelled off from exposure is going to give you some kind of protective sequestration. I would wonder whether that wasn't a, a feature at play there. Um, but I do think you raised the issue about the vaccine here. And I think if I have to point out one area in which this movie pushed into the realm of hyperbole, it was the compressed timeline uh, and the availability of vaccine from the time of virus is first emerging and recognized and identified. We're getting pretty good at sequencing and identifying them quickly with modern um, genomic tools that you saw, but we're not yet as good at moving from the genetic sequencing of a virus to the manufacture, distribution, and availability, widespread availability of a preventive vaccine. This was what, about 120 days in. I haven't seen that happen yet with any of the emerging threats. Um, we, have, we have trouble getting flu vaccine geared up and we know what it is and we make it, we pick the strains in advance and we make them, it still takes us nine months to get the strains and then by the time you've, made, you've chosen and, and made the vaccine for that season, if the viruses are, that are circulating in the globe has mutated, you don't even have a good match anymore. So we're still far behind in our ability to meet Mother Nature's um, ev ev emerging threats with countermeasures like vaccine. And I think, I think they wanted to make the point about dealing with scarcity and lotteries and other things, and they took a little bit of Hollywood license here. But unfortunately for a lot of emerging infections and SARS among them, we don't have medical countermeasures in the time we need, especially if it's a, an r naught a reproductive rate of two or more, and an incubation time or an intergeneration time on the realm of respiratory viruses, which could be you know, two to 20 days. Those things multiply so fast, faster than our technology allows us to get countermeasures, which is why we end up with these austere, old-fashioned, you know, 14th century um, toolkit to combat these types of epidemics. Uh, <laughs> I had my hand I, up. I, I had my hand up. <laughs> Um, is there any publication uh, that we could find in Ann Arbor that would help to uh, explain this to us? The movie? Or, or, I'm not sure, is there a publication that would help you explain how the movie was made? Is that what you mean? Or oh, what you just said. Oh, oh the, some of the concepts that I'm laying out? Yeah. There's a lot written about some of these things. Um, there's a whole journal that CDC publishes called the... Uh, Emerging Infectious Disease Journal, and there are numerous articles in there about how viruses um, emerge, how things develop resistance, and what types of tools to prepare. If you're interested in the respiratory viruses, there's lots written about pandemics of influenza, for example. And then there's a number of books in the, in the uh, lay literature um, which have been written about historical accounts, some of which Howard um, has written himself, that kind of go back and reflect. There's one in, good one in particular that he wrote called When Germs Travel. And he does sort of after the fact case studies looking at um, epidemics and how they've moved around the globe. That would be one place to, t 
uh, to go. I'm actually going to take advantage for having the mic in my hand because I have a question. Um, one of the questions, one of the things you talked about is the ethics involved in, in protecting people and what you can do in terms of civil liberties. And I know what's come up lately is an idea of a vaccine that we've had around for a long time of measles. And what do you do to say to people knowing that the herd you know, immunity is the, what protects us all, and yet can you force people to get vaccines if it's not something they believe in? So there's a, the measles story is a great one to, to you know, bite into this tough issue, and I'm glad we're having a national debate about this right now because I think you see, start to see the consequences. As we get good with vaccines, people have forgotten the devastation of the original disease, and what they hear more about is the very rare adverse event, which sometimes gets hyped up you know, broadly without scientific basis, or a bad study that was long retracted and found to be based on fraudulent data on measles and vaccine and autism, is now you know, propagated through the, the mythos, the, the misunderstanding of folks. And, you know, the best vaccine against this kind of fear and misinformation is education. But the question we've, we've been asking ourselves at CDC is wh who are the trusted sources of that information? And it's not always CDC or a government source. And what we've found recently from a number of studies that the most trusted sources of, re of reliable information tend to be people in your community, in your neighborhood, in your family. Sometimes it's your family doctor, but other times it's just the other you know, parent down the street um, who can dispel myths and provide reassurance. And so I think we all have a collective responsibility to educate one another about this. You're asking what should we move into the regulatory side of this. And in that arena, there's a lot of challenges. First of all, we live in a federalist um, society where state, state, in fact, quarantine and isolation are predominantly state police powers. The federal role in quarantine and isolation is interstate arrival, international arrival and interstate movement. Otherwise, the jurisdiction is locally the states. Um, if there's a failure of local control, the feds can step in. Um, but it's, it's, it's relatively limited in comparison. The same thing on vaccination requirements. They're largely state-based requirements. School entry, state by state, there's determinations on who can get waivers. And um, we see a patchwork of those decisions. We see an increasing numbers of parents who are choosing not to vaccinate. Um, which you know, I find it's just shocking to, to me as a public health practitioner when we have a tool that can eliminate that kind of suffering and disease. And then as you point out, it's not just an individual civil liberty decision, it becomes a public health and a population decision because there are many children and many people in the country who can't get the vaccine because their immune system precludes it. Cancer patients, people on steroids, other kinds of things for whom they can't have the benefit of that protection, and they are dependent on the c goodwill and the conscious and the responsibility of the community to achieve vaccination rates of 90 plus percent. And in fact, although overall nationwide, if you aggregate it, we're, we're pretty good, but actually if you start looking at the pockets of populations, there's large pockets um, across the economic spectrum, across the political spectrum, for a variety of reasons of people who choose not to vaccinate. And there are states which make it very, very easy to get a waiver from vaccination. And when those vaccination rates start to fall below 90%, they put everybody in their community at risk. And I think that is worthy of a national debate and whether you know, laws need to be tightened um, to you know, minimize the types of uh, reasons for waiver exemptions or whether people who refuse to vaccinate um, you know, are given permissions to enter congregate spaces when there's an outbreak going on. All those things are sort of ripe for discussion. But that's where this whole debate comes in about individual civil liberties versus public, public good, and it's not an easy one. And, and public opinion shifts over time around these same issues. We have one more. I think there, you know, I was having a conversation, this conversation around measles vaccine at, at dinner earlier this evening and was shocked to learn from Howard and others that there are large pockets of um, low vaccination coverage, you know, right here in, uh, you know, in, in this state and certainly in different um, districts within the state. So there's work to do in every place, even in highly educated communities, sometimes especially in, in highly educated <laughs> communities. <laughs>
Um, so uh, I, since Ebola, there's been a lot of uh, effort to try and get resources to West Africa to improve the public health system. Do you have any sense that uh, what's happened with Ebola and measles in this country, uh, and even you know H1N1 flu, are we? Are our policymakers at all looking at restoring or increasing the funding for public health agencies at the local, county, state, and federal level to be what they should be? Because we all know they've been cut over the years. Yeah. You know, um, one of the things that happens, epidemics are, um, can be major crises. And uh, many, many of my mentors, and I've certainly seen this as well, um, have, have highlighted the importance of making sure that you take advantage of the crisis to move the preparedness, to move the agenda forward, um, because there's a profound amnesia that sets in shortly after each of these crises. And people get through it, they forget about it, and suddenly they're falling back to the, the same pa uh, patterns. CDC hadn't seen real um, budget increases, you know, I think 2008 onward, it was doing more with less year on end, sequester and so on. Um, and this past fall, in a bipartisan way, with tremendous leadership and support from President Obama um, and many others, the message was loud and clear that not only do we need to do more for global health security and, and eliminate health disparities and weak infrastructure and systems because we're all connected by the air we breathe and the water we drink and the planes we fly on, but we also aren't as prepared as we think we are here in, in the United States at a state and local level. And even CDC you know, didn't realize how much more work in many ways there was to do to prepare um, states and hospitals for dealing with highly contagious epidemics. So, you know, to answer your question, things are getting better. We have this new appropriation, emergency appropriation. It's time limited. It's not a permanent addition to the to the base, but it came mid December, I think, in a bipartisan way from both parties of Congress. And um, it's divided into sort of three big areas global health security in the broadest sense, um, international Ebola preparedness and readiness, and then a domestic um, piece of, of each, about a, a third, but a, a substantial amount of resources were, were appropriated, and we're taking that responsibility to move the needle um, very seriously from, from that regard. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, we have one time or one more question, and then we're going to wrap up. Yeah, it's me again, but... Um, we saw in this movie that there is a definite battle to some extent between public profit health companies versus the public interest in health. Now, not taking flu viruses into consideration, because flu is an annual type of thing, but in the case of an epidemic, Ebola or whatever else it may be, what ability does the CDC or the government have to mandate public profit or private for profit uh, labs to manufacture this vaccine. For example, in this movie, they mentioned five labs who are gonna produce this vaccine, where I'm sure there's multiply more than that available in the country. And I know there's an incubation period for how long it takes to make a virus, but does the government or does C CDC have any control to make mass production, people jumping in and doing this without worrying about the profit concerns of each of these companies? It's a, it's a great question. I think that, that my answer to that would be there's both a government side and a government capacity and responsibility and government development and stockpiles for, for preparedness or around a variety of areas. And there is an important private role and there are many um, government private partnerships that, that are in existence already um, that involve uh, building incentive systems for development of orphan drugs or for work on vaccines. So the federal gov government, um, both CDC, NIH, FDA, um, through a number of different programs are actively um, both funding both the research into novel therapeutics and countermeasures and also the potential for scale up in the setting of a crisis, as well as for FDA to move through expedited emergency youth use authorizations. So those systems are in place. Those incentive systems are in place. We, we saw some of them play out with the scale up of production of ZMAP which was in very limited supply for use in, in Ebola treatment um, and being able to incentivize the private sector. And as you heard some comments in here, the, the private sector is looking for indemnification. If they're bringing something quickly to market in an emergency situation, they, they want some protections from liabilities for things that don't go through the long, arduous uh, 
you know, phase one, two, three um, clinical trials in scale and so on and around safety. So be between financial incentives to develop and expand production, um, protection incentives through indemnification, and research incentives through funding grants, that's kind of the way we try to augment both the private sector capability and then there's an in-house sort of parallel process within the government for you know, doing research and, and development around vaccines. Often the very first steps, identifying the virus, getting the sequences, global sharing agreements, all of that happens in the government realm and then moving into scale up implementation involves um, a whole series of partnerships, federal, state, local, plus private sector and nonprofits. So there's a variety of ways. Other countries do it differently. Someone mentioned Brazil. You know, Brazil has this system where all their public health vaccines are the amount and the quantity and the production, although they happen in academic centers, they're happening under government, um, you know, sort of licensure and scrutiny and production capacity. So they own most of the vaccine supply and they can adjust the, the production schedules to meet that. Uh, we have a different, a different approach in the U.S. Okay, thank you very much for coming to our Science on Screen. Thank you. I want to thank Captain Sachon for coming and Dr. Markle for the University's Center on the Medi History of Medicine for all this insight. So thanks. Um, if you want to find out more of the programs that we do, there's a si email sign up out front. You can sign up and get our emails once or twice a week letting you know. And thanks again to the Arbor, <coughs> excuse me, Arbor Research Collaborative for Health.